Hello and welcome to ELA Grade 10 for the week of June 1st. This lesson segment will cover Lesson 1 and touch on Lesson 2. Today you will synthesize multiple unit texts to compose an argument essay defending, challenging, or qualifying a given statement about power. So for this Lesson 1 specifically, you will complete the synthesis part of this lesson outcome and prepare to write your argument essay. Consider each of these statements. We all have the power to control our own destiny. You cannot be blamed for something you did in ignorance. Too much ambition is dangerous. Most people will do whatever they need to do to reach a goal. Sometimes it is necessary to do something wrong to get what you want. Which of the statements most resonates with you? This could be because you very much agree with it, very much disagree with it, or because you agree or disagree with parts of it. Once you've selected the statement that most resonates with you, think about why it speaks to you most. What experiences in your life or things you've learned seem to connect with the statement? Think about how the story of Macbeth connects to the statement you selected. As I mentioned when we reviewed our lesson outcome, the lessons for this week require you to synthesize information. So first, let's review what it means to synthesize. Every day you synthesize. You combine and interpret information from people, the internet, and other media, all while building and updating your own knowledge. Writing an essay, which includes ideas from multiple sources, requires synthesis. And when you write, synthesizing is a three-step process. So number one, you summarize the main ideas. Before you do anything else, you need to make sure that you understand the main ideas in each of your sources. Sometimes an author states the main point explicitly or outright, and other times the main idea will be implied by a collection of supporting details. Next, you'll make connections across texts. So once you've determined the main ideas of your sources, you'll see how they relate to one another. Look for similarities and differences. Look for ideas from one that add to your understanding of another. Once you've made connections and connected the dots, you will draw conclusions. You'll reflect on what you learned from each of your texts, put the related ideas and any conclusions you drew from them into a short paragraph. That's synthesizing. So later in the lesson, you will synthesize Macbeth, take it from Hamilton, and one additional text. You will use your synthesis of these texts to develop your argument for the statement about power that you selected previously in the Think About It part of this lesson. Next, you will want to read the article, Is Too Much Ambition Making You Miserable? and the passage from the article, The Remarkably Positive Power of Ambition. As you read each text, annotate to identify the reasons and evidence given to support the conflicting claims that ambition is a negative attribute and that ambition is a positive attribute. If you can, pause this screen, complete your reading and annotating, and come back to this lesson segment when you're done. If you can't pause your screen, take some notes as you follow along with the remainder of this segment, and then go back and complete each of the steps of the lesson in the order provided to you. Now that you've finished reading the text, you'll complete the synthesizing text chart using Macbeth, Take It From Hamilton, and one of the texts that you just read. You will use the information and steps in the synthesizing information part of this lesson to fill in the appropriate information in your chart. Let's take a look at the chart together and discuss what it's asking you to do. So the first thing you want to do is decide which of the texts from today's lesson you want to use to complete the remainder of this lesson and the second lesson this week. Remember that synthesizing involves summarizing, making connections across texts, and drawing conclusions. So which one of the two that you read do you feel you can best use to accomplish those tasks? Fill out that third box in the first column now. Next, you'll think back to Macbeth and take it from Hamilton. 
Do you remember enough about each of these texts to summarize them and make connections across texts? Check off the appropriate boxes in the first column for each of these. And then, if needed, go back to the text to refresh your memory before moving on. As you move on to the second column of the chart, you want to think about how do each of the texts connect to the others? So, how does Macbeth connect to the central ideas and claims made in the other two texts? How does Take It From Hamilton connect to the central ideas, claims, or themes in the other two texts? And how does the one text that you chose from today's lesson connect to the central ideas, claims, or themes in the other two texts? And as we now move on to the third column in the chart, you'll be drawing conclusions. Reflecting on the connections made between the texts, what can you learn? What related ideas do the connections bring to light? We will now move on to the defending, challenging, or qualifying your claim and brainstorming support part of this lesson. So when you selected the statement about power that most resonated with you in the think about it part of this lesson, you thought about whether you agreed or disagreed with this statement, or if you partially agreed or disagreed. These opinions or positions on the statements are also known as defending, challenging, or qualifying. To prepare for composing your argument essay, we will now review the definitions of defending, challenging, and qualifying. To defend a claim means to agree or support it. To challenge a claim means to disagree or refute it. To qualify a claim means to mostly agree or mostly disagree, but not entirely. So you may say that the statement is true except when and give specific instances when the statement is not true. Or you may say that the statement is not true yet sometimes and then show examples when the statement does prove to be true. Now it's time for you to organize your ideas in preparation for composing your essay in lesson two. So let's go through the points you want to consider as you brainstorm and organize your ideas. Which of the statements about power from the list did you choose? Record that on your paper on the lines provided. Next, are you defending, challenging, or qualifying the statement? Remember that defending means to agree, challenging means to disagree, and qualifying means mostly agreeing or mostly disagreeing. And from there, once you know if you're defending, challenging, or qualifying, you'll now compose a claim. On the next slide, I'll show you some example claims so that you can use them as models for creating your own. So let's take this statement about power. We all have the power to control our own destiny. If you're agreeing with this statement and therefore defending it, you really wouldn't need to make any changes. You would simply state this claim as true. We all have the power to control our own destiny. If you are, however, disagreeing and therefore challenging this statement, you might say something like, our destiny is outside of our control. If you decide that you agree or disagree with parts of it and therefore are qualifying the statement, your claim may look several different ways depending on what your specific argument is. But you have a couple of examples here to work with as models. One of them might be, we all have the power to control our own destiny, but only to a certain point. Or you might say something like, while our destiny is mostly outside of our control, there are some aspects over which we do have power. So now let's go back to your task. You'll compose your claim and gather the relevant details and evidence from Macbeth, take it from Hamilton, and the additional text of your choice from today's lesson. At this point, I want to take a couple of minutes to review the task for lesson two to ensure you understand how to write the best and most effective argument you can. So 
So let's go through a brief overview of the lesson and then you can come back to your claim and evidence. So as we revisit our outcome, you'll notice it is the same for lesson one. In lesson two, you'll be completing the last step to reach your learning target for this week by composing your argument essay. To get started with lesson two, you'll need to recall the claim about power that you are creating today, and you'll also want to review the brainstorming notes that you will complete in a few minutes. After you review your notes from today, you'll want to complete the argument organizer provided to you. And this organizer guides you to organize a classical argument, which you should remember from last week's lessons. Feel free to jump back and review them if you need a refresher on the classical argument. After you organize your argument in the classical argument structure, you'll write your essay. This rubric for writing arguments will be provided to you to review and refer to as you write your essay. You'll want to focus on the descriptions highlighted in yellow as these describe the criteria and expectations for high scoring essays. So in your essay, you'll want to be sure that you address the prompt by composing a clear claim and sticking to that topic for the entirety of your essay. You'll want to ensure that you develop your reasons and evidence to support your overall claim and that those reasons and evidence are grounded to specific examples from the three texts you synthesized in preparation for writing. Additionally, you'll want to be conscious of sentence structure. Not only are your sentences correct grammatically, but have you also included a variety of sentence types to show the sophistication of your writing style? And you'll want to be sure that your meaning is clear as you're writing. Your teachers should not be confused about the points that you are making. Now it's time to go back and finish lesson one. And in case no one has told you, you are awesome, you are rocking this, so keep working hard and doing your best always. I'll see you next week. Hello again and welcome to lesson one, both the print and online version for the week of June 1st. I'm glad you were able to join us today. My name is Rachel Weisfitch and I'm so happy to be here with you. You might find it helpful if it is possible for you to have a piece of paper, a pen, or a computer to record your thoughts. If you don't have access to somewhere to record your thoughts, no worries. Please just listen in today. By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to analyze how Baca develops a theme in Cloudy Day, and you'll compose a poem about your own Cloudy Day. Let's begin by thinking about poetry. Poet Jimmy Santiago Baca writes about the liberating power of language. In what ways can language be liberating? The word liberating, if you are unsure of the meaning, means saving, redemptive, rescuing. Our focus for today's lesson is on the use of poetic devices and how they develop a theme. We'll be talking about figurative language and as a recap from last week's lesson, figurative language is used in poetry to create layers of meaning. The reader accesses the layers of meaning through the senses, symbolism, and sound devices. It brings the reader deeper into the theme of the work without the author directly having to state the theme for the reader. The poem we'll be reading and analyzing today is called Cloudy Day by Jimmy Santiago Baca. This poem is found on pages 373 to 374 in collections, or you can find a copy in your print packet. First, take a moment to read Baca's short biography. What words or phrases stand out to you when you read this? Baca learned to read while in prison. There, he realized his passion for poetry and began writing. A year after he was released, he published his first book of poems. Baca has dedicated his life to writing and teaching others, particularly those who are struggling with hardships and are working to overcome them. 
As you read, consider the poetic devices Baca uses to develop a theme, as well as the details that tell you about the author of this poem. We are now going to read the poem one time together. It is windy today. A wall of wind crashes against. Windows clunk against iron frames as wind swings past broken glass and seethes like a frightened cat in empty spaces of the cell block. In the exercise yard, we sat huddled in our prison jackets on our hunches against the fence, and the wind carried our words over the fence while the vigilant guard on the tower held his cap at the sudden gust. I could see the main tower from where I sat, and the wind in my face gave me the feeling I could grasp the tower like a cornstalk and snap it from its roots of rock. The wind plays it like a flute, this hollow shoot of rock, the brim girded with barbed wire with a guard sitting there also, listening intently to the sounds as clouds cover the sun. I thought of the day I was coming to prison, in the back seat of a police car, hands and ankles chained, the policeman pointed, See that big water tank? The big silver one out there sticking up? That's the prison. And here I am, I cannot believe it. Sometimes it is such a dream, a dream where I stand up in the face of the wind like now, it blows at my jacket, and my eyelids flick a little bit while I stare disbelieving. The third day of spring, and four years later, I can tell you how a man can endure, how a man can become so cruel, how he can die or become so cold. I can tell you this, I have seen it every day, every day, and still I am strong enough to love you, love myself and feel good, even as the earth shakes and trembles and I have not a thing to my name, I feel as if I have everything, everything. Now we are going to dig deeper into the poem. We are going to be working in the learn about it section of both your print and digital lesson. If you don't have access to either, please just follow along with me on the screen. Tone is the poet's attitude toward a subject. Poets often communicate tone through their choice of words and details. Reread the first stanza. What words or phrases reveal the tone? How does the speaker feel about the situation based on this evidence? When we reread the first stanza, these words stand out. Wind crashes, windows clunk, iron frames, seethes, frightened cat, empty spaces. This shows us that the speaker feels angry, frightened, closed in, or trapped. Writers often choose words because of their connotations or the emotional responses associated with them. What words in lines 7 through 12 have negative connotations? What feelings do these words convey? Did you notice the words huddled, haunches, vigilant? These words convey the feelings of being trapped. Writers use personification to give human-like qualities to inanimate objects. Let's take a look at lines 1 through 12. What is being personified? How do the human-like qualities affect the speaker's attitude toward life in prison? Did you notice that wind is being personified? The wind seething like a frightened cat shows the feelings of imprisonment, but the wind carrying our words hints at a feeling of freedom. Let's keep going. Similes and metaphors are types of figurative language that compare two things or ideas. Similes use the words like or as, metaphors do not. Figurative language communicates ideas beyond the literal meaning of the words and can make descriptions and unfamiliar ideas easier to understand. 
Recognizing figurative language can help you better understand the ideas in the poem. In lines 15 through 16, there is a simile. What is being compared? What do you visualize? How does the simile help you understand how the speaker feels? Did it make you think that the simile can help us understand that the speaker feels he has the power to uproot the prison tower as easily as he could uproot a corn stalk? Are there any other examples of figurative language you notice in the poem? What ideas do these comparisons convey? Now let's take a look and think about the image of the wind which is found throughout the poem. How do the wind and the speaker's attitude toward the wind change in stanzas one through four? Did you notice that in the first stanza, the wind crashes and seethes, seethes? In stanza two, the wind carries their words out of the prison yard. And in stanzas three and four, the wind blows in his face and plays like a flute? Either through the digital version or directly onto your print packet, go ahead and summarize lines 36 to 46 and identify the tone, citing examples that support your response. I invite you now to answer the try it questions one through four. This is a great time to pause the video if you are able to. Have you completed your questions? I invite you now to take a minute and check your work. Answers will vary for question one. Did you notice for question two that the poet is disillusioned and powerless at the beginning, yet hopeful and empowered at the end? There is a tone shift there. 
In question three, did you notice that the speaker has changed since the beginning of his prison term when his situation was most difficult and hopeless? That's what the flashback helps to show. And in question four, did you notice that a theme of freedom and power emerged by the end? The wind shows how weak and trapped he is, but by the end, the speaker can stand up to the wind. Before we move on to the Show What You Know assessment, I invite you to revisit our opening question. Our poet writes about the liberating power of language. After reading Baca's poem and reading the brief background on his life, in what way might language have been liberating for him? I think you're ready now for the Show What You Know. Don't forget that this week, there is an optional extension. It's purely optional, but I'd love for you to give it a shot. Thanks for joining me today for lesson one. I hope you can join me again next week for another ELA GT10 lesson.